production of 155,000 units in the state. And the three long take and mid major takeaways of the report were, in order to achieve long run affordability, we must uh, have sustained production of housing units. Building units at lower cost in transit accessible, high opportunity neighborhoods are the key to improving equity in the region. And that leveraging existing infrastructure through smart growth you know, is the only way to be fiscally sustainable for local governments. So today I think we want to look at how missing middle housing specifically fits into those three uh, findings in the report. And first, for a little, a little background, I think it's important to understand that when we look at uh, the top 50 metros nationwide, the trend is certainly not adding density. Only 10 of 51 or 50 metros uh, have increased density since 2010. So Portland is one of those uh, 10 markets where it's roughly less than a percent uh, denser on average for a neighborhood today than it was in 2010. Conversely, you see many examples of markets that through sprawl are increasing their land from which they're developing and in doing so decreasing average density in neighborhoods. The relationship between population growth and density is pretty clear. What we can see in the chart is, uh, as we move from left to right, is increase in population. So, for example, Austin had the largest population growth since 2010. They've also had the second highest decrease in density during that time period. If you look above the line uh, horizontally, those are the 10 markets where we've seen average neighborhood density increase. Uh, Portland is, of those 10, the third highest in terms of population growth. Seattle is really the outlier here, where they've been able to achieve uh, high population growth and increased density at the same time. And that's due to, A, the, the fact that they are severely land constrained, so they can't expand their land. And B, the fact that the economics for development are right for high density, certainly in the around Amazon and other uh, high tech uh, firms in, in, in that neighborhood. Without going into extreme detail, uh, Dr. Zapata did a good job describing kind of the, the basis of exclusionary zoning. If we can look at just a quick history of the city of, of Los Angeles, a recent study was published where it looked at the capacity of zoning versus the existing number of units. If we go back to 1960, there was zone capacity for 10 million units, and at the time there were only 2.5 million. So that's to say 25% of the use capacity. Through the use of exclusionary zoning in single family neighborhoods, the capacity has decreased over that time period from 1960 until today to around 4.3 million units. At the same time, rapid population growth in Los Angeles has caused population to grow from 2.5 million to 4 million. So, what we've seen is 25% capacity in the 1960s to now over 90% of its own capacity. And that has really uh, disrupted the land and economics of, of development. So what is missing middle? Really, it's this notion of units between two and 50, and really it's emphasis on more like two to four is, is the sweet spot. When we look at the long run trend nationally, we see that, for example, in the 80s and 90s, more units between, more buildings with units between 20 and 50 units were built than buildings with 50 plus units. When we look at today, 2000s and 2010, we see fewer units being built, buildings with units uh, of 50 and less. And that's really what's been coined this busy middle in that it, the middle range from single family to 50 percent, uh, 50 unit plus, really isn't getting built uh, at all, or certainly to the extreme that it was uh, nationally prior to, let's say, the, the 2000s. When we look at the stock of all rental units nationally, we see that more than 50 percent of all units that are rented are missing middle. So that is to say, between two and 50 units in a building, uh, that's the majority of the housing stock. On the ownership side, it's skewed to be certainly all, almost all uh, single family units. So one of the key features I think of Missing Middle is the question, how does that impact affordability? How does delivering Missing Middle units uh, affect the, the cost to rent a unit or the cost to own a unit? And we look, again, apologies, a lot of this data is, is gonna be Portland centric, it's just due to the, the, the better availability of data. Uh, but it's, this holds everywhere that we've looked. You, re you really see a strong link between missing middle and naturally occurring affordable units. So that is to say, buildings with less than 50% 50 units are much more likely to have units that are naturally occurring, so that is to say not regulated at rents that are 80% or less of MFI, which is considered to be workforce housing. We see that, for example, if we look at buildings with less than 10 units, the average age is 70 years old. If we look at buildings with 
50 or more units, the average age in the Portland market is 26 years. So the 